Real Chat episode 39, a special tribute to Wes Craven. I don't think it's possible to, or, or advisable, or even smart to call yourself an artist or talk about yourself as an artist. I mean, uh, first of all, the, 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 it's a business, and uh, to forget that or ignore it or act like it's not there is is just idiotic. I guess what I've tried to do is I've tried to make movies where I can honestly say I haven't seen that before and to follow um, my deepest intuitions and uh, in some cases literally my dreams um, so that I don't feel like I'm copying something that's come before me. It's been fun to be in the, uh, in the business and to survive. It's been fun to sit in the back of audiences and watch them scream and jump and laugh. Um, it's always gratifying to see how smart the audiences are. Somebody once, when I was first starting in films in New York, says, if you want something on your gravestone in, your, in the film business, I think the best thing is filmmaker. If you can honestly say that, that's all you need to say. And that's, uh, that I think would, I would like that on my gravestone, along with whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Everybody, welcome to episode 39 of Real Chat, a podcast that promises week in, week out, the real world as we know it. Today, we have a special tribute and retrospective to legendary American film director, writer, producer, and actor, Wes Craven, the man who became synonymous with genre bending and innovative horror, challenging audiences with his bold vision. But like our James Horner episode a few months back, today's episode isn't about mourning. Today's episode is about celebrating the life and career of an exceptionally talented man, honoring his craft and legacy in the best and only way we possibly can. My name's Adam Stolfo, and I'm joined here as usual by co-host and friend Bro Savard. Bro, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. It's fun looking back at some of Wes Craven's films, and I, I watched uh, probably three or four films in the lead up to this just to refresh myself. But Wes Craven, especially when I was a kid, just a massive name in horror cinema. And Absolutely. Everything he did, you kind of checked out from the video store and had a good look at. So, yeah, very influential. So, it'll be fun to have a look at his Well, I think uh, his name career. became a selling point, didn't it? Yeah, by the time he did the Scream films, that, that, Definitely. Was, that was a big deal. Joined here as well by uh, good friend Stuart Wilson. Stuart, how are you doing? Very good. Very excited to talk about Wes Craven. Could we say that he's an iconic director? Can we use that word? <laughs> Adam, like, Adam hasn't used it yet, but I'm sure it's on those notes. It's, it's only a matter of time, I think, bro. Freddy Krueger is uh, definitely an iconic character. That'll hey. come up. <laughs> That'll come up. <laughs> Has become a little bit of a subtitle to our shows, hasn't it? <laughs> it's fine, Real it's fine. And the iconic <laughs> elements of film. And joining us again as well, Mr. Matthew O'Neill. Matt, how are you doing, my friend? The iconic. The iconic. Mr. <laughs> Matthew, 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 Matthew O'Neill. O'Neill. Matt, can I just say right yeah. off the start, I, I, I could not have done this episode without Matt here. Oh, me either. He, he's, he's bringing credibility in spades here. He's a, he's oh, a must. shit. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, no, I'm a big fan of Spielberg. Uh, let's, let's, let's get into it. No, um, it's been a that tough gross. year for, for horror fans. We had the Christopher Lee is gone. Still waiting for the tribute episode on that one. A bit disappointed. Oh, you didn't you didn't mention this to me off air? Uh, no, he likes to don't really speak to each other off air. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Uh, Christopher Lee, yeah, I mean, he was he was the first one. I mean, he's not the only one, obviously, this show, but uh, I'd say Wes Craven's right up there with him as being, uh, I will say, like a, a master of the, the horror genre or someone who's definitely very much uh, part of the horror family. Yeah, in our inaugural episode, uh, Bruce and I were speaking about who was coming on to Real Chat, all the guests we were hoping to have on, and we were speaking about your good self and Andrew. We did say that you were the horror guy. Yeah. It's taken a while, but we've finally gotten to... It's, it's, no, we did, no, we did American Wealth in London. True. That's true. Which is, yeah, yes. horror comedy. And, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I like my horror. I, uh, one of the guys that runs the Melbourne Horror Film Society here, I used to run a horror T-shirt design, film design horror T-shirt thing, and uh, now for a did living that, I design did, did horror you, film posters. Did so you wrap up the T-shirt times. business because you just found it hard to describe? Or? I, yeah, yeah, there was that. Um, and, uh, what do actually, you do? Film, horror, T-shirt, design, horror, T-shirt, film? Yeah, ah! Just, just, could I be quit! Us. <laughs> but, um, it was actually called... Uh, actually, I forgot what it was called. It's... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> it was actually called It's Only a T-Shirt, which uh, oh, was actually go. taken from the last house on the left, Wes Craven oh, film, cool. which is hey. It's Only a Movie. So there you go. What are your, some of your initial thoughts on Wes Craven, guys, and his, his career? I mean, he's been working on films since the early 1970s. Yeah, how would you guys sum up uh, your feelings about him? It's an interesting thing uh, about Wes Craven because he's synonymous with horror cinema, but he hasn't made all that many films at the end of the day. He's only got 29 directing credits in terms of a, as a director. But, God, the films he made definitely made an impact, and I think that's really significant. Mm. The, I mean, obviously, Nightmare on Elm Street, but also Heels Over Eyes and then the Scream series later on. And even the film Shocker, I remember watching that on VHS as a kid. Absolutely loved that film. So, yeah, and that's something I was talking to Matt about just before we recorded, because I think that's... He's not the most prolific, but definitely one of the most influential filmmakers in horror. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Like, he definitely... When, when he did a good horror film, it wasn't just a good horror film. It was a, a game-changer. So Last House on the Left, followed by uh, The Hills Have Eyes, two real ultra-violent horror films, real visceral and and uh, disturbing. And then he just would kind of vanish. I mean, look, while, while he is a, a horror director, I think he was, he was looking for that job where, you know, someone would give him a great script and he'd, he'd go and film it. But uh, it always seemed he, he came back to horror. Like, he, it was the, the thing that kept him in the business I guess it was a real struggle for him uh, unlike his uh, his friend Sean Cunningham who uh, went on and did uh, Friday the 13th at the start yep. he had a, you know, a huge huge hits with those films so uh, and he often yeah. he often went off as well and tried a few different genres but always found his way back didn't and he so yeah, it was like his didn't like really his work niche. the other genres either yeah. but, um, I'm sure we'll get into that so. what about yourself Stu what are some of your initial thoughts about Where's Craven yeah you can't really you, the horror wouldn't be the same or well, modern horror wouldn't be the same without him. Um, obviously, he seemed to dominate in the 80s. And and like you say, his name was on every single video cover. And then I I felt that maybe uh, his name didn't hold quite so much clout in, in the 90s. Early 90s while, onwards, yeah. Until Scream came back in. And then suddenly, you know, he managed to hit that, strike that gold vein yet again. And um, yeah, and those films are among my favourite horror films. Well, the first two. Not, for, not so much the specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something with the Scream films, especially too, the idea that Craven would direct a film kind of deconstructing his own genre to a massive extent. So, uh, Well, he, he, he had to do it twice, of course, too, because he did it a couple of years earlier and it didn't work, for, work it out very well. Yeah, no. yeah uh, but we'll get to that, I'm sure. We will get to New Nightmare. So Wesley Earl Wes Craven was an American film director, writer, producer and actor known for his work on horror films, particularly slasher films. He was best known for creating A Nightmare on Elm Street featuring the Freddy Krueger character, directing the first installment and Wes Craven's New Nightmare and also co-writing A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors with Bruce Wagner, which I think is regarded as the best it's of awesome. the series, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, the best sequel, definitely, anyway. I, I mean, I mean, it's, obviously, it's all personal. I, number yeah, one's the I best think, for me. But I think the consensus as is... As far as sequels go, number three's, yeah, yeah. Is my yeah. favourite. Craven also directed all four films in the Scream series, as we mentioned as well, and co-created the Ghostface character... Some of his other films include The Hills Have Eyes, The Last House on the Left, The People Under the Stairs, Red Eye, The Serpent and the Rainbow, and Vampire in Brooklyn. <laughs> have you seen <laughs> Vampire on, in it's, Brooklyn? Yeah, it's pretty. Have you seen that one, Bruce? It's, well, I don't think I've seen anything with Eddie Murphy post 1990, so. Yeah. I think that was. That Around was like the time the, he stopped being funny. Was that, well, that was like way. the beginning of his downfall almost, uh, yeah. that film. <laughs> like, quite, quite seriously, like if you track it back, like that was where it kind of. Started to go a bit wrong for Eddie Murphy, but like that film, apparently uh, the troubles they had with it all came back to Eddie Murphy wanting to play it as a serious brooding vampire. And uh, I think the rest of the guys on set had an idea it was going to be a comedy. So uh, it got quite messy in the end. And yeah, just that film as a result doesn't work at all. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and he was raised in a strict Baptist family. And he earned an undergraduate degree in English and psychology from Wheaton College in Illinois and a master's degree in philosophy and writing from the Johns uh, Hopkins University. He briefly taught English at Westminster College and was a humanities professor at Clarkson College of Technology in Potsdam, New York. And during this time, he purchased a used 16mm film camera and began making short movies. When his friend Tom Chapin informed him of a messenger position at a New York City post-production company run by his brother, Craven moved to Manhattan. His first creative job in the film industry was as a sound editor for Chapin's firm. 
Recalling his early training, Craven said in 1994, Harry was a fantastic film editor and producer of industrials. He taught me the Chapman method of editing. Nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts, get rid of all the shit. Craven afterward became the firm's assistant manager and broke into film editing with, how's the name of this title? You've got to walk it like you talk it or you'll lose that beat. Wow. 1971. There you go. That's fair enough. So, um, yeah, that's quite an interesting like, little story there about how he got his start. It's, it's not uncommon in the Hollywood machine. There's a, there's a bunch of filmmakers that kind of got their start in uh, industrial films or World War II films or things like that. Yeah. And phenomenal, I guess because the concentration was often on the nuts and bolts, like you mentioned, when they had a chance to get creative, because they understood the fundamentals so well, they could really, really kind of uh, build from that. I know, uh, I, think he's, I can't remember his first name, but I think it's Rosenblum that directed uh, The Exorcist and he's directed a couple of Woody Allen films really creative editor that started doing military films uh, in the 40s in, in Manhattan and just an expert with it, working his way around film and Wes Craven, similar background. So He left the academic world in the more lucrative role of pornographic film director. <laughs> in the documentary Inside Deep Throat, Craven says on camera he made many hardcore X-rated films under pseudonyms. Mm. While his role in Deep Throat is undisclosed... Most of his early known work involved writing, film editing, or both on these productions. Yeah, it's um, pretty tough writing pornos. Yeah, that's a, it's <laughs> quite a gig. Keeps you busy. Keeps you busy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but his first feature film as a director was in 1972, and this film was The Last House on the Left. Now, have you seen this, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I have seen it, and unfortunately the remake as well. Okay. Because um, <laughs> that's Wes Craven has a lot of films that have been remade as well. And like, films that he's shepherded through the yeah process. that's true yeah been involved in it in yeah, some, some so. shape <laughs> which is strange isn't it I guess um, are there any signs in The Last House on the Left that we've got, we've got someone of note here like it was just such a, a violent I mean it's basically a, two girls getting raped in a last house that happens to be on the left it's clever isn't that's it that's handy oh, <laughs> yeah wow um, it was a real brutal film and disturbing and I guess I, you could say it was quite fresh for mainstream in the 70s uh, to come out and a complete departure for what I guess Wes Craven would go on to be known for with uh, with his uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets and, and definitely Scream as well but um, I guess it's also what people were after like they you know they wanted sex uh, in, in their films and they wanted violence uh, he just really amped it up of that film and yeah. uh, and there was a response to, I guess to you know what was going on there I mean Wes Craven was a uh, a big activist uh, on the the university circuit you know um, going to uh, lots of um, what do you call them when you're against something protests that's the one <laughs> protests um, do you think I take a mini protest uh, no, 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 not of late not of late um, mainly because I can't remember what they're called um, but uh, yeah and uh, you know so it was there was definitely uh, undertones of the uh, what was going on in Vietnam at the, at the time and stuff like that coming through in his films and look that's one of the reasons he got into filmmaking uh, apparently the story is he got dragged to the cinema to see uh, uh, Night of the Living Dead uh, okay. Yeah, and there was a film which you know had all this uh, political subtext running through it, which he he kind of looked at that and thought, "Wow, I, I can do this with film. I can do this really well with horror film." So uh, yeah, it's kind of he's not like someone who is a huge horror fan as a child, from what I'm led to believe. You know, like you, you hear about John Landis or you know Rick Baker or uh, Tom Savini, these people who loved their famous monsters magazines and things like that. I don't think he was one of those guys. I think he was just more. He's quite an intelligent chap, uh, an English teacher, and I just think he thought he could use that medium to say something uh, through horror. So, yeah, different different kind of way into the, into the genre compared to most. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon at the time to use horror, I guess, as an analogy for commentary that you want to make about Vietnam especially. Mm. And especially because you could sneak it into kind of the B-film kind of drive-in era showings of them then you could get away with it and you know hope to change some people's minds I like I like Last House on the Left it's basically a revenge movie basically but um, yeah the subtext is there and also when you've got such low budget filmmaking the easiest way to attract people's attention is to make it sensational and exploitative which is what it was mm. but I liked it a lot more than the film that came after <laughs> <laughs> funnily enough now Craven frequently collaborated with Sean S. Cunningham uh, in Craven's debut feature, The Last House on the Left, Cunningham served as producer. Mm. Later in Craven's best-known film, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Cunningham directed one of the chase scenes, although he went uncredited. Now, I don't actually know which scene this is. It's the scene with the goat. 
Oh, really? In the, in the opening, when she's having a dream and there's a goat, apparently. Oh, yeah, yeah right. I'm not sure how much of the scene, when the, when the scene starts and ends, but that bit is directed by him. So yeah. Cunningham is better with goats than Craven. Is you get that in a t shirt. Yeah. Did, did you put that in a t shirt? <laughs> I should have, should have put, that, put that in a t shirt. That's, uh, yeah, I'll think about it. I, I, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll resurrect it. Again. Yeah, work, work out where it is and start it all up again. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's something to me, for me to work on. That's great. Their characters, Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees, appeared together in the slasher film Freddy vs. Jason, with Cunningham acting as producer while screenwriter Victor Miller is credited as character creator. It's funny, I was, say- I was saying before the episode that I think in my head in the 80s, I always kind of assumed that these were dueling franchises because these were the two huge horror franchises of the 80s. And it never even occurred to me that the two filmmakers were friends. And it's kind of like that Arnie Stallone thing. Yeah. We assumed they were enemies, but I don't mm. think they really were and they just used it to they their did, advantage. They used it to their advantage and they just they ripped each other about it. Yeah, yeah so... That's it. Yeah. Later in the Last House on the Left remake, two thousand and nine, which you've seen, unfortunately, yeah, I'm, right? yeah, both Cunningham and Craven share production credits on that. It's funny, yeah. I didn't, I didn't bother to see that film. Even the trailer was awful. Like yeah, it was bad, and it looked really low budget. It looked really crappy. If, to be fair, I, I uh, spit in your grave remake, and <laughs> this film just kind of blend into oh, right, me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I think just... this one involved a microwave. I seem to remember. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. That's it's right. Yeah, the microwave prominently in the in the the trailer Craven's also known for launching uh, for, or for playing a hand in launching uh, actor Johnny Depp's career by yep. casting him in A Nightmare on Elm Street um, which was obviously Depp's first major film role and interestingly as well here Matt uh, Craven created I love this name of this series Coming of Rage um, a five issue comic book series with 30 Days of Night comic book writer Steve Niles oh, right. uh, the series was released in digital form in 2014 by Liquid Comics with a print edition scheduled for October 2015. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so Well timed. Or badly uh, timed. Yeah, no, no, sure. Actually, yeah. poorly yeah. timed. Maybe it's just episode. publicity for it. <laughs> <laughs> Craven's works tend to share a common exploration of the nature of reality. Uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street, for example, dealt with the consequences of dreams in real life. And in Scream, the characters frequently reference horror films similar to their situations. And at one point, Billy Loomis tells his girlfriend that life is just a big movie. This concept was emphasized in the sequels as copycat stalkers reenact the events of a new film about the Woodsboro killings occurring in Scream. Scream included a scene mentioning a Richard Gere urban legend. Craven stated in interviews that he received calls from agents telling him that if he left the scene in, he would never work again. (laughs) And of course, the last film that he directed before his death was Scream 4. Yeah, so. what they meant to say was not that you'd never work again, that your next job will be a really shitty film, and that was Screen 3. And um, Actually, it's not true. Music of the Heart was the next <laughs> film. <laughs> Craven designed the Halloween 2008 logo for Google and was the second celebrity personality to take over the YouTube homepage on Halloween. Well, there you go. And Craven had a letter published in the July 19th, 1968 edition of Life magazine praising the coverage of contemporary rock music, in particular Frank Zappa's. So just a couple of little notes on some of his other work outside of film. Yeah, in the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street doco that uh, we were talking about earlier today, Adam, uh, Frank Zappa pops up on that as well, yeah. Yep. I think they seem to influence each other a little bit yep. throughout their careers. His next film wasn't until 1977, The Hills Have Eyes. That's quite a break between between the two there. Yeah, and I think we'll notice that more and more as we go through his films, he, there were large breaks between them, or like he'd do them in twos. But uh, yeah, The Hills Have Eyes, yeah, I, I, this is one of my more favourite films of his. Just, I guess just because of the... Uh, it's not necessarily the genre it started, but I guess it took from that whole uh, like deliverance, John Bowman's deliverance, and... Uh, just uh, turned it up to 11 like uh, again another full on film uh, hugely influential um, what you call, uh, Sam Raimi has it uh, appear in his uh, Evil Dead film uh, a little nod to it which is it's a cheeky play off which uh, it starts in the hills of ice has a Jaws poster torn in half saying you know Jaws is not that scary this is real horror and then uh, yeah it went on and on th- through uh, some of their films all the way up to Evil Dead 2 where the, the Freddy glove appears in the, the basement so you can look out for that. Does everyone know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, this isn't, yeah, this is nothing groundbreaking. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I quite like this film. And it's also one of the few remakes I actually don't mind as well. Oh, thank God. You're, okay. You're, is, <laughs> you're a fan of the, of the remake, This aren't you? is what I was worried about. I was coming here today and I'm like, I'm going to have to hand back my um, Real Chat membership card, which are quite nifty and are embossed. 
with made yeah. out of uh, stainless steel, like the uh, DeLorean and Back to the Future. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> um, I, it's true. I love the Hills Have Eyes remake, and I, I did see it first, so that has something to do with it. But I love Alexandra Arger's earlier film high tension was yeah. brilliant and then he made this and it was a jaw-droppingly amazing and one of the best character arcs in a horror film ever where the absolute dickhead at the start of the film becomes the hero and you you really don't yeah. see that coming yeah. so and yeah and then i saw the original and was horribly horribly uh disappointed in retrospect but that's one of the few remakes i would put you, as a genuinely you, you love that film, film. i, I do you raving I do. about the remake of it Hills came, came at a time of some good horror like dawn of the dead's not that bad either no, i mean i love the too. original Great. dawn of the dead but dawn of the dead remakes yeah, not that bad the, even possibly that director's best film some people would argue uh that's a great point yeah <laughs> bros in particular oh no i'm just trying to think of his other the films to see what can Oh no wait that owl one was pretty cool not that any of us saw no that no one saw that oh, right, no. no I would say that's his best film yeah. <laughs> by miles I think it is too by miles definitely yeah, yeah so the, the Hills Have Eyes yeah I came to it too late and I saw them in the wrong order but I, I love the remake so much that I just yeah I, I just find Michael Berryman's is so uh, in the original in the original like, you know it's just uh, iconic like the poster everything mm. uh, there's that word again iconic I mean I saw that originally when I was like yeah, a yeah. student so it's um, yeah I guess it sticks with you a little bit more but I can completely see what you mean yeah and you know what's you know point. what's strange is that we we discovered that in his private life he was a birder which means someone that breeds birds we we're discussing and yet the canary so. doesn't do too well in the hills have eyes no what's going on there it doesn't do well at all does what it? kind of bird lover would put that in a film but neither do females do too well <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good so, point hmm. yes <laughs> yeah there's a <laughs> The, the title of his next film, which was just a TV movie, was uh, Stranger in Our House. So there was already a common theme amongst the titles here about uh, which direction Craven was going down. This is the, right. And there's a number of made-for-TV movies that have many titles that they all get mixed up. Early 80s that he this made. Is the one, this is with Linda Blair, I think, is it? Is that right? Have I made that up? I might be making that up. Let's oh, it was say. also called yeah. Summer of Fear. Right. This Linda is why Blair. I'm getting confused. It does have Linda Blair. There you go. Yeah, it's Linda Blair. Right. Yeah. I think I have seen this film. I'm pretty sure I saw it on DVD. I haven't seen this one. Yes. No. Um, but it, it was very much a made-for-TV movie, and there was no class there. Fran Drescher's <laughs> in it as well. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I have Quality. seen that one. I remember now. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Quality. Yeah. Yep. We move into the 80s, in which he really started to come into his own. Uh, a film called Deadly Blessing. Have you seen this? Yeah, this is this is quite a cool one. I haven't seen this for, for years, but this is um, this is not that bad. I'd recommend catching that one up. Yeah, yeah, a good a good double with witness since it's <laughs> set in an Amish community. No, yeah, no? yeah maybe. Yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, <laughs> uh, anything's a good double with witness. I reckon. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's got a pretty cool release through Arrow Video. I can yeah. tell you that much. Mm-hmm. It's it's worth. Uh, I mean, anything Arrow released really is worth getting hold of. But is that um, right? So I don't know anything about them. Arrow Video. No. Oh uh, yeah, Arrow Video is yeah. uh, fantastic. Cool. Uh, British in- English. Yeah. 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 Blu-ray DVD. Yeah, probably kind of, like leading. Could uh, you say they're the British version of Criterion? Is that fair? Yeah, I think I think they take it a step further though, don't they? With the, yep. I mean, I mean the restorations, yeah, but the yeah. Um, the extras you get with it, like the uh, oh, posters yeah. and booklets yeah. and. The, They're well thought through extras. Oh, thing. definitely, yeah. yeah Interchangeable yeah. covers and, like, yeah. it's just a bit more... And the uh, good thing on. with Blu-ray is we're the same region as the UK. That exactly. is true. So. Yeah, it works out well. Because there's, there's more DVD regions than there are Blu-ray regions. There's yeah, only they two they Blu-rays, isn't there? Three. Well, there's and three, they, right? Yeah. They have all this new commissioned artwork by, uh, you know, Tom Hodge. You guys know the Tom Hodge Dude Designs? Does some fantastic... If oh, you cool. Can, okay. Google Dude Designs. It's uh, amazing. Yeah. Nice. Poster artwork, yeah. The following year, Swamp Thing, another one he directed. Yeah, with Adrian Barbeau. Yeah, Swamp Thing is uh, so it was based on the, the comic book, and it's not that good. <laughs> so, it's know. based on the comic book before Alan Moore came to the comic book too. Yes, right? yeah, yes, yeah. It's. Um, I don't. I think. I think uh, when he went into it, he had. I think he was promised a bigger budget or, or something like that. But uh, the budget they ended up with was nowhere near that, and. It ends up looking like a film like that, if you know what I mean. Like it's it's, it's just, funny. You look at the poster and it looks like it's it from looks the 50s. Amazing. No, no, no. The, the poster I'm looking at now, it's like, is this the 50s? Oh, no, wait. Yeah. It's actually 1982. No, the, so that's, the, uh, that's not the, the original poster for it. Oh, the original quite one? quite a cool one. Okay. Like the, the, no, no, no that, yeah, you're right. It does look like it's from like the, the 50s. Yeah. But uh, it really, I, th- I, I really like that poster. Nice. Right and it does promise. Uh, even like when you were a kid in the video shop, yep. that VHS promised a lot more. Which a lot of VHS covers did back in those days, but uh, that was one particular one which was disappointing. Mm. 1984 brought along 
the film that he's known for to this day, A Nightmare on Elm Street, yeah. the original. Yeah, this is a great horror film. This is, yeah, this is my favourite Wes Craven film, and I'm guessing it might possibly be a few people around the table's favourite as well. I'd say I mean, it probably would be mine, yeah. Uh, I, not, not just the film, but I mean, the, the character of Freddy Krueger just basically took over the 80s from after this, didn't it? I mean, it yeah, was everywhere. Yeah. It, like, you know. Well, so question, film- Freddy Krueger was bigger than the films. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he, was, he was a pop cultural icon. Yeah, well, including the, the, uh, the Freddy vs. Jason film, there are nine films in this franchise. Yeah. I mean, you could argue it did better for Robert England than it did for Wes Craven. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wes only did two of them. Yeah. yeah. Cause he, or three. Three of them. Mm. Yeah, he directed two, but he, he wrote, wrote one of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, and, yeah. yeah um, Robert England is also in eight of the nine films. That's right. And there's talk of him. So we've obviously had the remake... Yeah not that long ago which was not very good at all uh, it was horrendous of Nightmare on Elm Street and there's talk of them rebooting it again yeah. with Robert England oh is there talk I just read an interview with England role. saying that he doesn't think he will be playing uh, this, so, this was like in the last couple of weeks yeah well yeah. the last couple of days he posited the theory that he, it'll be a, re- a reboot from Dream Warriors and right. he was saying he wasn't sure maybe he's being coy Nightmare on Elm Street is the the Freudian subtext to the dreams is just so amazing and, and the production design and the whole spinning room thing. It's just like the kind of horror film that a lot of filmmakers, I think, like to watch because they would, there's just so much, uh, so much creativity on screen. There's like so yeah. much in there. Even just this, this spinning room scene on its own was mm. incredible at the time. Um, and being dragged across the ceiling and yeah, stuff like that. It's stuff. just like it's, it, horror doesn't even ask that of a filmmaker and they did it if you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, the sequel's yeah. less so, but yeah, it is quite incredible to watch. And it's still quite horrifying now. That first big death scene across the ceiling, I watched it again recently with someone that had never seen it, and they were, they were shocked. Yeah, as, as a, growing up even now, like I, I look back as like, you know, the, the scariest moments from horror films, and for me, one of them's in Nightmare on Elm Street. And it's just something so simple, and it's when she's at school and she's having that dream and, and she sees her friend in the body bag and oh, the, yeah. the, you know the yeah. thing crawls like that that haunted that me as a me kid chills. you know like yeah. that really frightened me but um, it's interesting where Wes Craven got the idea f- for this film like I again even though I said he, he wasn't much of a horror fan as a kid he, he had a nightmare as a kid apparently this is just how the story goes he had a nightmare as a child went through to his mum's room to go into bed with his mum and she said look I can look after you but I can't look after you in your dreams <laughs> and this is something that stayed with him for years all the way up to this point and uh, yeah in that spare time there he had he, he came up with this and, and obviously the other story about Freddy Krueger being his, uh, the bully from school is uh, is pretty cool as well Just so uh, what is that story again? so Freddy Krueger is uh, the name Freddy Krueger was the name of the bully at school who was he him. actually Freddy Krueger? I believe so yeah okay. I, think, I think his name was Freddy Krueger okay so, uh, right yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. Yeah. That, uh, that story about his mum, was that good parenting or bad parenting, do we think? I'm not sure. It's good that she took him in to look after him, yes. but then just... And by the way, well, you're still going to be fucked. He's so. got to be prepared for, you know, there's no, no point lying to him. In 1985, The Hills of Eyes Part 2. This is a, it's not a very good film. And, uh, I, you know, it, it, I had a lot of troubles, but uh, the best thing I can say for this film is it has one of the most amazing film poster artwork from out of Italy for an Italian one panel which is like this close up of a a woman with a barrel of a gun in her mouth like it just (laughs) looks so violent and uh, terrifying but that really is the best thing for the film <laughs> honestly like it's uh, if, you, if you, you google it, yeah if you google that like the Italian put like it just looks incredible the artwork but it's and, and you think Jesus how could you put that up in a cinema you know what I mean like, it, like it's yeah. the most violent poster I've ever seen but uh, the film is just uh, have the, you seen um, that one Stuart no no I haven't yeah the Twilight Zone show he did uh, five episodes of it also in 1985 yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen any of the 80s mm. Twilight Zone. So it was uh, one of the uh, head writers on uh, the 1980s Twilight Zone is one George R. R. Martin. Yeah. Uh, which is one of the jobs that he had early on in, in his TV career. So. so he actually finished something. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, the, no. I think the network finished it for him. Yeah. Yeah. Fair yeah. 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 I mean, these days, the most he's finishing is a bucket of KFC chicken. Yeah, but, um, oh, 1987, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. Uh, just an executive producer and a writer this time. Yeah. And this is, this is the most fun 
This Probably is the most fun. Of, well, yeah, it's not his film, I guess, but yeah, the most fun, definitely, of the Nightmare on Elm Street. You like films. this one, Bruce? Look, after one, they're, they're kind of all a bit fuzzy for me. Nightmare on Elm Street. It's, so it's understandable. Sure I've, I've seen it. They like, blur into each other. So yeah. number number two, kind of feels like its own thing and Completely. doesn't really relate to the rest of this the series as a whole. But then number three kind of builds of upon it. what we saw in number one. It's and John Saxon back, so it does. Yeah, John Saxon. It does. Yeah, yeah, I know. Anyone? Saxon. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> John Saxon shows up in Scream 2. Does he really? He plays the police officer in one of the Scream films anyway. Okay. Because he's a police officer in this one as well. In fact, I think he's a police officer in every single film he's ever been in. He's ever been in. Yeah. Yeah. No, but yeah, he's... uh, Yeah, in Scream, he plays a police officer in one of those too. It's really Mm. cool. But he's uh, quite bald at that point. Yeah, incredibly But he was quite bald for the first Nightmare on Elm Street and apparently he arrived on set and had two toupees that he said to Wes Craven, he's like, do you want me to wear this one, which is a bit of a fuller toupee, or this one's a little bit thinner? And he chose the slightly thinner toupee. It's funny you say that. So John he... Saxon's been bald a long time. Oh, as a kid, I always used to think he looked a bit like Sean Connery. So yeah, right. It's funny to think he was because also not only toupee. looking like him, he's got the toupee action They shopped at well. the same place. Mm. <laughs> uh, did we skip Deadly Friend? Have you seen Deadly Friend? This is a film that's very popular because of its penultimate scene being on YouTube. Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen Deadly Friend. I've seen the... You've seen the, the scene, scene with yeah, the basketball? What's the yeah. story? The story, I haven't seen the film. It's got to do with a robot and crazy stuff, and it features... Oh, Christy Swanson's in Christy, that one. Yeah. It, Hello, Buffy. Yeah, features Christy Swanson. Yeah, but the bit where uh, someone gets de- decapitated by a basketball is the oh, bit wow. that kind of went viral on YouTube. If you look it up, you can you can find it. I'll be looking that up as soon as we finish recording. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah a good throwing arm. That's all I can say. The Serpent and the Rainbow. Oh, yeah. I love this film. I absolutely adore this film. Yeah? I discovered this film, I think, on DVD. For some reason, it came out on DVD. No, the video store I worked in, it was sitting in a dusty corner, and I saw it on video, and then came out on DVD. And I, I really it's like creepy. it. It's really good, and it's silly at times. Mm. And, and, and Bill Pullman, Yay. actual Bill Pullman. Not, bo- not Bill Paxton. <laughs> <laughs> Is there... <laughs> And and I love the, the voodoo stuff, and I love that they went and filmed it in in exotic locations. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I love based it. on a true story. Based on a true story, I'm yeah. not sure how much, but yeah, I think that was the because um, the true story is really interesting. The guy, I, I, oh, well, I can't even remember his name, uh, but the the man it was based on was kind of one of the the guys who brought back the whole notion of zombie to. Uh, to the Western world, like um, the voodoo zombie, rather than the the uh, George Romero right, yeah, zombie, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it sounded like it was going to be an epic film at the time, but uh, obviously it kind of wasn't as big as it could have been. No, not many know? people have seen it. it. It seems that way anyway. And but it's got some real creepy moments. In oh it, yeah, and, and some know. some cool nightmare imagery that brings back Nightmare on Elm Street kind of stuff. Yeah, I definitely haven't seen it. Yeah, it's but you really recommend good. It? Yeah, it's mm. really fun. Yeah, cool. Great front cover as well. One of those ones that you kind of like. What the hell's going on? And, there, and the know? tagline is "Don't bury me. I'm not dead." <laughs> it's a great tagline. <laughs> I should put that on a t-shirt. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's, it's a great scene. <laughs> Shocker. No. Oh, I love this film yeah. when it came out. It's bad. It's bad. It's not good. But a big fat guy that brings a... himself back to life using electricity after he got electrocuted. I mean, this is great. <laughs> it's just such a great... I remember watching this on VHS. It's, it was one of those films you got to when you'd seen everything else. It's like, okay, we'll watch Shocker. And you get it home and it's a riot. It's just oh, great I gotta fun. i got to check this one out. Yeah, you've never seen Shocker? Never. God, some yeah. big fat guy zapping people. Uh, there's a no, scene just, where he runs through a park and it's just realize, ridiculous. I love it. <laughs> realise that it. I, you know, there's a lot of Wes Craven stuff I've got to go and check it's, out. It's also one of those film titles that's setting up reviewers for the first blow, isn't it? It's just... <laughs> the, yeah. the cover for Shocker always reminded me of, uh, you know, the Ghostbusters 2, the, the two brothers and yeah, the yeah, electric yeah. chairs. And I always used to think, wow. Oh, the Scalari brothers. Got, yeah, they've already got their own <laughs> spin-off. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, that's a fun film. It that's, is really yeah, fun. That good one, fun little that, horror, kind of light-hearted '80s horror kind of uh, moment. There, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's good fun. Like whereas the Last Serpent and Rainbow is a lot more serious. I'd that, say. Than... Do you think maybe that because the Serpent and Rainbow didn't do very well, he went back to the trashier stuff? Oh, I is think that also because it was a lot. It was like a lot of this stuff direct video, you know, like um, mm. Nightmare on Elm Street for him was you know theatrical and mm-hmm. very popular. But then you just it's just easy to churn these films out, you know. By mm. that, well, this was uh, late eighties, early nineties, you know. So uh, a lot of. Uh, horror films you were seeing on the shelf around about then just seemed to say Wes Craven on them you know yeah. just, uh, just yeah. easy for him it's, it's a bit like it either has Wes Craven or Stephen King on the cover yeah true like his name. Stephen That's King was it. a massive sell 1991 The People Under the Stairs yeah this is a good fun film well yeah. I, I think it's a good fun film I don't know if anyone else has I seen it I haven't actually it. seen it but I thought I heard it was 
is it quite N- silly? No, I think I think <laughs> when it came out, it was looked upon like that. But I think now it's it's kind of like okay. it's, it's a bit of fun. We screened this one uh, with the Horror Film Society, and you know, a lot of people really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's uh, funnily enough about people under the stairs. No uh, way. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, no, it's it's cool. It's like you know, it's um, it's, it's set in a uh, like a it's not you know, a house with like this like secret you know what would you call it like, not secret rooms but like they live between the, the yeah pa- I guess like these secret yeah. passages through the house that they live between and live under the stairs and yeah it's got some good good little shocks in it and I look as far as like. I would recommend The Last Serpent as one great. to check out and Shocker is fun but this one I would recommend as well it's a good, good laugh it's a good title I like the title yeah Wes Craven's New Nightmare in 1994 which is the seventh film in the Nightmare on Elm Street yes. franchise yeah I went to yeah. this this is like the only one I went to the cinema to see I went to Jenny, yeah. you guys yeah see I didn't quite go that far but this is Probably the only uh, Wes Craven film I ever hired as a new release overnight. Right, because <laughs> yeah. you're old enough. Yeah, this was actually... And also, we didn't go to the cinema much when we were kids, but uh, yeah, this I, one was... So I, I never watched all the Nightmare on Elm Street films when I was younger. When I was a teenager, I saw the first one, and I saw this one. And they're the only two I'd yeah. seen, which is actually not a bad you did way all right. to watch the yeah. series. Yeah. Probably three and it was only the years later when I went uh, all the way through. I was just about to say, I actually watched the Nightmare on Elm Street series, one through nine now... Not that long ago. I, I had seen a couple of them. Like, I think I'd seen three, and I'd definitely seen one before. But I sat down specifically to watch the entire franchise. Yep. And I hated this movie. Oh, really? really? I love this film. I, I love it. so much fun, this film. Yeah. But, no. but, but what I can't... Yeah, no, Matt doesn't like it either. No, no, but you see, I, it was one of the most... If, if I can just... Uh, I'll just give you a little, little story. Okay. This was one of the most terrifying films I'd ever seen at the time. I saw it here in Australia at the Hoyts... That used to be on Burke Street yep. near where in Minotaur City, yeah. which yeah. is very one of, was, was one of the most horrifying cinemas yeah, in definitely. Australia. <laughs> me and a friend went to see it, so this was like one of the first times while in Australia it was just me and a mate going to a cinema, and we got, arrived at the cinema. It was packed, and uh, there were these older, tougher guys there walking into the cinema just behind us, and I'd forgot something and spun round and sent this guy's drink flying all over his face and his shirt, <laughs> and these guys were ah, just ah. looked real tough. And I just I didn't know what to say, you know. So I just kind of like sorry. Well, yeah, I think I said sorry, but then we just kind of ran into the <gasps> cinema and sat down. And for the rest of the film, I was just shitting my pants, thinking that I was going to get the shit kicked out of me at any moment. But uh, I can't really much remember the film after that. So, <laughs> You're but, just um, look, looking over your shoulder the whole time. I think if I rewatched it now, I'd enjoy it a lot more. So but, you haven't uh, seen it since. I then? haven't seen it since, oh, and wow. it's because I didn't enjoy it. Plain and simple. I found it. Oh, I found. Okay. I found Scream did what it was trying to do a yeah. hell of a lot well, better. That's, that's yeah. the funny thing. It, it does. Yeah. But I don't quite get why Scream was a like runaway success, and this was one of the well, lowest I grossing think we sequels. Because Freddy Krueger. I think that's why. I think because we were getting another Nightmare on Elm Street film, and you wanted to see Freddy. Kruger yeah. not have all this exposition about you know a film within the film within a you know is it a dream yeah, is it a, I guess I think that's why but I think that's why watching it now might, might that be would different. explain why I'd like it actually because I like the film up until the climax when it yeah. just becomes the a third Nightmare act Elm Street it gets film. a bit a bit much for me but I love all the other stuff all the oh yeah the weaving in reality into the fiction and I love all that stuff yeah, see, bringing back the original star from the first see, film and that yeah, I didn't I didn't buy it um, I didn't like it I love all that stuff no no good that's great I, I love no, Wes but, Craven's cameo in uh, towards the end of the oh, Oh, like, oh, all that yeah. stuff I ate it up as a, as a teenager I guess um, and just I, I, yeah. I, and I watched it, uh, bits of it uh, before today and still enjoyed the bits that I saw so with you though the climax I'm kind of at that point it's like oh, it's a horror film now but well um, it's not even a horror film it's the same as the last yeah. six films in the series mm, yeah, yeah exactly I guess, I guess what you were getting out of it I simply wasn't I wasn't on board with the concept I mean the other thing too is that when Scream did finally come out everyone was surprised that Wes Craven would you know kind of take the piss out of his own genre people forgot about this film I guess well because yeah. no, not many people went it. to see it yeah it, it was it was a very poor box office I some really I big remember. tough looking scary guys <laughs> apparently with uh, <laughs> soft drink all over them <laughs> well apparently um, and, they, uh, never, his mate. they never got in touch with Johnny Depp for it and he would have been up for it that's oh wow! Oh, yeah, I did hear that, wow. and, and the story is that Wes Craven was too embarrassed to ask him. And you can just imagine that film might have done a little bit better at the box office as well. Because what? Johnny, oh, you're talking what, about like a like a big role. He was going to be in it. It's yeah. weird because he's had a, he had a cameo in the previous uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. He's on TV at one stage and he's cooking, and it's like yeah, right, okay. and I think it's yeah. in Freddy's Dead. Johnny. Isn't it uh, Johnny Depp and Roseanne Barr? 
on a cooking show together? Is that that? I thought he was by himself. Oh, anyway, maybe. I just found it weird that Wes Craven was apparently too embarrassed to ask him because Johnny Depp was already was on his way to now. being a big star. Yeah. yeah. And then and Johnny subsequently said, oh, I would have always said yes to Wes Craven because he's the guy that gave me a start in the industry. Yeah. Like, mm, mm. which always, yeah. So it seems like missed opportunity. I just assumed it was a small role, but are you thinking it was like I'm, actually a, a major? Just, I'm not sure. It's just actually to be in it. Even you know, just like, uh, and and the, the fact that he never asked, that it's a missed opportunity. Because, like, yeah. as we said, he, he, I think, I mean, what was he in round about this time? He was definitely... Edward, Don yeah. Juan, DeMarco, Dead Man, Nick right. of Time. So his career hadn't exploded yet. Well, I mean, Donald we're Brasco talking was Oscar, away. a gazillionaire, but he was, yeah. yeah. He was, was his name above the title? I think it was. Yeah. He so was he'd done it with anyone Zans. else in that film. Anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's put it that way. The following year, 1995, Vampire in Brooklyn. Yes. It's, it's, uh, do we have a skip button? Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I actually have to skip. I, yeah. I, I never saw it, so I can't even... Okay. I mean, look, I guess they were trying to cash in on the uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula vibe that was going on and, and yeah. make something in that the vampire interview with the vampire as well. Yeah, yeah. I what, guess. Uh, what was but, uh, Leslie Nielsen's vampire film? Did, uh, dead, dead, dead and Loving, and loving It. it. Was, yeah. that, was that better than this piece probably, of Probably, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, probably. Didn't, it didn't, probably didn't aim quite so high, and that's fine. The, that's exactly why it works <laughs> 95 so what other horror would have been that, that year was that uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein might have been that? I don't know yeah so that gothic horror thing was still riding high yeah. and yeah. they destroyed it with that one so yeah 1996 of course Scream which was an insanely popular film and um, as I would say is probably my favourite of his okay yeah. I, I know it doesn't really make sense on its own if you haven't seen a lot of other horror movies you don't get as much out of it but the the great thing I got from this is I remember watching and going, wow, this is, it's deconstructing a horror movie. It's, it's laid out all the rules for us. Horror's never going to be the same after this. They're all going to be really clever, really well-written horror films. And then they just kept churning out the same horror movies yeah. and everyone keeps making the same mistakes. And I'm like, but we've all seen Scream. How can we watch these horror movies? That's just history repeating though with horror, I, isn't it? That's... It's just, yeah. And I don't think anything took it the next step until maybe Cabin in the Woods, which f- kind of felt like the next step. Although Cabin in the Woods doesn't succeed quite as well. The, good, the amazing thing about Scream is that it actually scared the pants off me at That's the it. same time oh. as being hilarious. Hilarious. That, yeah. that uh, opening sequence with Drew Barrymore of Scream it's phenomenal, is just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. other great thing, even yeah. now, like rewatching, you know it's going to happen. It's yeah. still well done. The other great thing about that opening scene, and it's something I observed watching it this time, is that that's a good 15, 20 minutes of the film. It's a big chunk yep. of cinema time. But what that does with like a 90 minute or 100 minute film is it eases the pressure on the story that fills out the rest of the film it's basically like having a short film before the film which sets all the characters up or sets the the villain up at least and it's a really nice shot kind of you know beginning middle end kind of part of the story but it just means instead of having to try and stretch out a horror story for 100 minutes or 110 minutes it just takes 20 minutes off the top and the rest of the story is a lot more manageable and it means the script can be a little bit tighter and and you know you sometimes you get the feeling with horror films that there's like 20 30 minutes in the middle that is just put there because the running time hasn't quite made it yet yeah so yeah having that at the start really you know, it lets you have some of the more talky scenes later on and, and, and build it slightly in a different structure, more of a 60, 70 minute film with the bit tacked on at the front, yeah. which, which I really like that as a, as a concept when making a film that you could spend so much time setting up this villain, a brand new villain in, in horror cinema history, credibly, and then ease the pressure on the rest of the script. So I, I really, um, really like that. This is a, a game changer. This is like, uh, if for me, it just seems like, I mean, when it came out, I wasn't a big fan, but now uh, I, I really appreciate this film. What, what do you think you didn't like at the time? Um, I think, do you know what? I think because I was, what, so what year was this come out? 14, uh, I would have been, is this 94? 96. 96, so yeah, 16, 17. It's, I think because uh, they were depicting me, you know what I mean? Like that was sweet, that that was supposed to be me on the, the screen as a teenager. Your, and your Jamie just, Kennedy? Yeah, I mean, this this for me, is, it felt like a, it kind of kick-started Dawson's Creek or something like that. Like, you know, we had this all this TV well, come in. makes sense. It's oh, same writer. Same writer. Yeah. Well, what, but I mean, like, it felt like it opened the door for that. You know okay. what I mean? Like, that, that all the... Uh, Teenagers just doing a lot of talking, you know, yep. like just over the top. And I guess at the time, I just kind of was like, "This is, you know, it's crap." Not not realizing the mm-hmm. self-referential skills that were being put through this film, you know, like that's something I guess I've learned to appreciate over time, rather than at the time when it came out. But um, again, along with uh, um, Last House on the Left and Nightmare on Elm Street, this film is, uh, you know, it's it's not a bad going for a director to have that amount of game changes, like something that really yeah, has. Mm-hmm started a new genre almost or you know really uh 
pulled up some trees in, in the genre. So, uh, mm. yeah, I, it's uh, quite an event, not just in horror cinema, but just the, cinema in general. The only disappointing thing is that it didn't affect horror as much as I wanted it to, like yeah. I was saying. So, you know, I, I saw M. Night Shyamalan's The Visit yesterday, and we still had a moment where the character inexplicably went to the dangerous scary place and you're like there's there's no narrative reason for this to happen and we went through this all in scream why aren't you being sensible <laughs> you still haven't learned from scream when i saw scream it was in a completely full cinema everyone was on board everyone was terrified laughing it was great and throughout the film there are it's kind of a murder mystery vibe because you're trying to figure out who the killer is which was another aspect of the film i think that um that hadn't been seen in these previous films quite so much it was like who's the guy behind the mask which is a lot of what it's a giallo almost yeah yeah and um there are so many nods in there and quite a few obvious red herrings like deliberately over the top and at one point the i think it's the police the sheriff goes to put out a cigarette after saying something com completely nasty about children and and puts out the cigarette with his boot and it's it's clearly over the top and you go i know this old sheriff is not really ghost face but the guy in the cinema in front of me elbowed his friend and went it's the shoes it's the same <laughs> shoes and ever since then every time a film has something like really glaringly obvious that's that's just should have been subtle but wasn't i just i just feel the need to yell out it's the same shoes. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah followed up the following year of course with 1997 scream 2 Regarded as a fairly good sequel from memory. One of the good. It's a pretty yeah, dance, right. strong sequel. Yeah, up until I think the climactic scene where I start to go, eh. But it was still scary at the, the first half. I yeah. thought it was very I, scary. I think the, the setup's a bit heavy handed. It's a lot more violent, I think, this film. It's not nearly as clever. I think some of the film references are a bit wedged in there's that little conversation in the classroom about sequels yeah um, which is it's kind of nice but it's not as quite it's not quite as well done as the first film yeah, not as smart um, it's, but it's still an enjoyable film and it's you know like a good sequel it's nice to revisit the characters and so. it's, it's, it really does build upon the first film and that yeah. film within a film idea and the opening scene with the death scene in front of the cinema screen is so operatic and yeah. over the top I really like that and I'm amazed that they managed to turn it around in a year I don't know if Kevin Williamson had started writing yeah, this. Yeah, I, I got the feeling the script was pumped out pretty quickly. But and, had he started been... writing maybe before even Scream sure. was picked up? Not I don't sure. know. You get the feeling, I mean, just the fact that it's horror that they probably would have had a few in mind, but it does does feel I like guess it wears Craven horror as well yeah, yeah it does feel like the same thing again yeah but, um, and, and Jamie Kennedy's uh, exit is also an excellent scene yeah that's really yeah. tasty when he takes when he takes on the killer on the phone and, yeah. and that showgirls line and, which um, I'm sure offended you a lot because you love showgirls as no, no, you mentioned on the show it's a good film nothing wrong with <laughs> yeah. showgirls yeah it's a great film yeah, yeah, I like yeah. the uh, line in Scream 2 uh, you've got a heart on for Cameron man because <laughs> I was there <laughs> yeah, talking about I was there in my seat going like oh, talking so about do. Terminator like, <laughs> like right now yeah. Yeah. 1999 Music of the Heart <laughs> Oh no! You know, this I, this um, one is have you absolutely seen it? horrifying. Fuck no! I I my my brother's a huge Craven fan, so I borrowed the box set of I mean, on Elm Street, and I borrowed the Scream films from him, and he gave me this one as well, and he <laughs> kind of handed it over and said, "Well, it's one of his films that I've got. I'm not sure if you'll." And I haven't watched it yet, so I apologise. Uh, but I'll be handing that back unwatched, I think. Got right back on the horse with Scream Three the following year, <laughs> um, which has to be one of the worst and most disappointing third film in a franchise ever and it was really clear from the outset because Kevin Williamson wasn't there and for whatever reason he couldn't do it and they, they got Aaron Kruger uh, who went on and did things like The Skeleton Key and I think he co-wrote one of the Transformers movies and he worked off Kevin Williamson's notes but it's just it's awful. Does anyone agree with yeah, me? It's, it's, I, it's, it's that bad. I like cursed better than it. It's ham. That's how bad it is. <laughs> I, yeah. I it's, saw it's ham, it. It's ham fisted. I oh. saw it in 2000. I've never seen it again. I can't remember anything from it whatsoever. Parker so. Pose is in it. That's good because she's it, awesome. It goes into full on comedy mode. There are two good things about that film. One is uh, Cotton Weary's death in the opening scene is actually quite well done. Um, and that's quite scary. And I remember seeing that in cinema and thinking, oh, here we go again. This is going to be another thrill ride. And then it goes into comedy mode. And it does that annoying thing of retconning what happened in the first film where they explain hey actually the killer in the first film wasn't the main killer there was another one which is just the abs an absolute no-no yeah, right. no. sequels it, yeah yeah and it also annoyed me because they kind of suggested they 
they use that as an excuse in the film. They go, oh, yeah, the uh, final film of the franchise uh, always goes back and retcons something that happened in the first. I'm like, it doesn't always. In fact, most of the time it doesn't because it's really annoying. To be fair, the shit ones do, and this one definitely slots in with oh, wow. that. Maybe it's yeah. a really clever film. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, yeah, and the only, other, the only other good part of the film is the bizarre knife throw moment where Ghostface <laughs> throws the knife, it spins in slow motion through the air, goes to kill the person like hit them right in the forehead but it's the handle that hits them in the head and it's this bizarre slap all you needed was someone to slip on a banana peel it was so strange did I you watch this again recently or uh, I yeah when Scream 4 came out I rewatched it alright okay I wonder yes, Scream um, 4 yeah of course I wonder if because the scary movie franchise was such a huge hit off the back of the Scream franchise if there was pressure on this film to amp up the comedy a bit was that out by that point scary movie would have been was out it? by 2000 surely they pump those out pretty quickly. Let me, let me look it up. Like four of them as well. Scary movie. Oh, there's like five, eight. Five. I don't know. There's fucking too many of them. Scary movie was 2000, same year. Okay, and yeah. and little quiz here. The original script for Scream was called Scary Movie, and Scary Movie is dropped in the first Scream film about eight times. Different people talk about horror movies as scary movies scary movies yeah scary it makes movie. sense that it was called scary, scary movie, movie yes yeah. so there's some cool cameos in scream 3 though it's the first it's the only appearance oh my god it's the only appearance of silent bob and jay outside of a kevin smith oh film. my god why i don't know why at that makes point, no sense. i'm like wait you've no just sense. completely taken me out of the film yeah. what carrie fisher pops up as well which is pretty cool ah oh, it's bizarre it's bizarre but you know it's nice to see lance henriksen uh, oh, mm. one of your favorites mate he pops up and roger corman roger, well. corman, roger yeah. corman yeah as a studio executive uh, there's one other scary moment in the film where she falls asleep and uh, uh, dreams that her dead mother is outside the window right in front of her in a house at night time and that moment actually is quite terrifying quite but good. overall it's just a it's ridiculous a rubbish, film. I've deleted film. this film from my memory yeah. of none of this stuff is <laughs> me too even yeah um, pumping through the 2000s now cursed oh this is such a bizarre film because it was such a, a troubled uh, production process have you seen just, this Matt yeah just, I, uh, just quickly too should we highlight between Scream 3 and cursed it's a five year break for Wes Craven again yes yeah. I think he was just rolling around he was in doing, his money exactly, yeah. he was doing a lot of <laughs> cameo appearances acting and stuff like that he certainly That's wasn't a- writing this piece of shit though <laughs> yeah cursed I, I actually I'm a big werewolf movie fan so uh, I was quite excited when this one came out uh, and it had Pacey from Dawson's Creek who also it. shows up in Scream 2 there you go as does yeah. Portia de Rossi who's in cursed and she's in Scream 2 as well and uh, yeah it just really is a uh, poor film like uh, it just wow. wasn't and well executed I was all. so excited when it was coming out yeah me I was too like, where's Craven uh, Christina Ricci and written by Kevin Williamson who wrote Scream I'm yeah. like and a werewolf and film like how could it go wrong and it goes yeah. wrong so spectacularly and if you've seen it it's really clear that there's probably an hour somewhere on the cutting room floor like the film is bare bones like they chopped out a chunk of it that wasn't working yeah. and they they, re- they tried to fix it in post in the same year as Cursed Craven did Red Eye did anyone see the original um, teaser trailer for Red Eye? no because yeah. it was fantastic because it just played up the fact it was basically the majority of the trailer makes it look like a romantic comedy the same as the film <laughs> it starts off it's romantic comedy bumping into each other in the airport isn't this funny and then for the last 10 seconds of the trailer, it suddenly goes, the new film by Rez Craven. And you go, what the hell? And the music goes sinister. And we see Killian. Killian Murphy's eye start to glow red. And he looks out the plane window. And you think, what the hell? And then just says red eye. And you're like, wow, oh, nice. this is... What? Is he a vampire? What's going on? And when you sh- when I actually watch the film, and I, I, l- I actually love this film. I think it's good as well. Yeah, yeah, you show it to people. What you do is you skip past the opening titles. Because the opening titles makes it clear that it's going to be a thriller. So there's like like the exciting yeah, right. music and people doing the shipping like uh, rocket launches and stuff. Get past that and just get to Killian Murphy and... Rachel um, McAdams? Rachel McAdams meeting each other and just tell them that you, you're showing them a film. Don't tell them what genre it is and just watch them slowly realise. Because the, the scene where Rachel McAdams realises that Killian Murphy is not your average ordinary guy sitting next to you on the plane is just an immaculate piece of direction yeah. it's so perfectly done that the creepiness comes in it's, it's just when she's trapped basically on the, when she, yeah and yeah, she's sitting next to him and he makes some off the hand comment and it's that first moment where you go hang on that's not quite right and mm. it's just uh, it's so amazing yeah I really enjoyed that the end I, I mean you've got to end the film somehow once they get off the plane yeah, yeah it's but it's good. like um, what phone booth or uh, even Barry just yep. that, being trapped in one spot on this plane it was um, I, and I really also the it. uh 
Oh, managing to do a film with like like that with no blood, where at one stage someone gets stabbed in the neck, yeah. but there's still no blood is quite strange. And she is <laughs> she she is cut from the same uh, cloth as um, uh, Sydney from Scream, though she is very similar character. Yeah. That's and uh, the- I'm a big fan of Killian Murphy as well. Mm-hmm. I think he's he's uh, well, really this good. This is man. the uh, the Craven film that I'm the most interested in checking out now. I actually haven't seen it. Oh, you should. It's good. So, and, and uh, it it's makes cool. Sense. It's cool thriller. Yeah. It's more of a thriller it's, than yeah, a horror. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if I want to check it out. And he yeah. should have done more thrillers. I'm surprised. I saw that and went, hey, you're quite good at this. Yeah. <laughs> then over the next couple of years, he, uh, he he served as executive producer on a lot of remakes of his own films. So there was The, the Hills Have Eyes, which you spoke about before. Yep. There was uh, The Hills Have Eyes 2. Which was awful did you see that Matt uh, yeah I mean it, the source material is not great anyway but yeah it's not <laughs> well it doesn't even they didn't even stick close no, to the source didn't, material no they didn't it seems to be cursed that this film was, will stop <laughs> this was also a job he gave to his son he, he co-wrote it with his son it had a really good teaser trailer as well and I was really pumped and then I think it even went straight to DVD here I don't yeah, think yeah, yeah, yeah it didn't come out of the yeah. cinema and it was yeah. rubbish it had an opening scene that was kind of good and horrific but was just a bit too exploitative for me and then the rest of the film's just rubbish it was the it was the aliens premise as well it was a, a bunch of soldiers go in to the same place from okay. the first one yeah. Yeah. yeah and then of course Matt the last house on the left uh, remake in the remake yeah which I mean it's not it's, it's such a tough film to remake those films like same with I Spit on Your Grave I just yeah. like so they, they were been... of their time and they were you know they were so horrific then It's and, and that was kind of I guess to an extent the catch like it was just this ultra violent rear revenge films and it's I, I don't know I just I doesn't fit so well now. Like, is it, is know, it fair to say the reason they all happened then was because of Saw and Hostel and Torture Porn being so popular? That's why they got I mean, remade? What, what year were those? They feel like they were on the, the tail end of Torture Porn even. Because I'd say after Scream, as, as we were talking about before, I'd say Torture Porn, like you said, Eli Roth. With, uh, mm-hmm. I know Cabin Fever isn't really... It's more of a zombie yep. uh, film, but then definitely Hostel, like I'd yeah. say. And, and Saw, obviously, they're the yeah. Torture Porn. kind of. That's, that took over, you know? Mm-hmm. Took away from what we had with Scream and... What was definitely becoming quite tired, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 the Hills of Eyes too. Just, I mean, I guess maybe that's why they did remake the most to get on board of it. And it, Hills of Eyes is definitely a, an excellent example of a remake. But um, yeah, the rape revenge flicks just don't. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I, they're not nice to watch anyway. They're the yeah, best time exactly right. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, mm. I hate them. Those movies make me really uncomfortable. I'm sure, they're like a key plot point in Back to the Future, but other than that, uh... <laughs> now, that's a rape movie I like to talk about <laughs> right there. Um, and, and incest as well. It's yeah, very, yes. Yeah, it could have been ice. directed by Wes Craven. Mm, yeah. yeah. Next week, Matt. Yeah. Next week, <laughs> my soul to take. 2010 oh, this was garbage I, I didn't even see it it was in 3D too wasn't it it was really bad <laughs> yeah it's funny I saw the trailer and I thought this doesn't look any good it was in 3D and, as well this is, yeah. the, this is the year after Avatar yeah of course yeah everything yeah. was in 3D yeah yeah yeah. so okay. yeah not worth it obviously no it was like a mixture of um, I know what you did last summer meets a little bit of Nightmare on Elm Street just stacked together with shit and made into a film <laughs> I, I, I guess almost like a trying to reboot like trying to it's worth you know noting shit's, shit's not as adhesive as you'd think no either. that's right yeah. it, like it seems some, like it'd be quite adhesive but it's not some sticks some, so, some sticks yeah. it'll stick yeah. um, but it's not so good at, at, at joining two alien elements together but um, I think you know what, what what they did with Scream so well tapping into that uh, that teenage vibe I guess just did not exist with this film like I think they tried to do something again and get in touch with the kids of today and it just didn't like, yeah. is yeah. it self aware at all is it clever does it think it's clever it's almost like one direction horror film if you know what I mean like it's, <laughs> I, I don't, don't know I what think it's means. just for the case just the sake of having some young good looking okay. kids on the screen you know and then he had his last directing gig the following year 2011 Scream 4 <laughs> This is a big uh, franchise. For me, this was a wonderful return to form. So Kevin Williamson's back on board, which is automatically awesome. And the argument is that there's been a good 10 years of horror films that you can lampoon and you get to make fun of torture porn, obviously, and, you know, Facebook and social networking and all these things you can add in there. I loved it. I won't get into the end, but I am certain, absolutely certain, that the last 10 minutes were changed and that the version I have in my head of how that film was supposed to end would have led straight into the film after it that never happened and it would have been much much better and would have been really shocking and something horror films hadn't 
done up until that point but instead we get an ending that's kind of the same as what we've seen before I don't think I've seen it okay I've seen one two and three and I've, I've, I've got four sitting in front of the TV so that's, I might actually you have should to watch check it that. out the opening scene is awesome yeah cool yeah, it's, no it's I'm excited bad. to see it I didn't realise oh my goodness Williamson yeah, no, and Craven were back together you really should you really should I will it, check it out it, it is worth checking I just out man. Never, I just never bothered just because I was it's uh, burnt on three yeah, yeah I mean I enjoyed it, Red Eye as well uh, but just where's Craven for me it, you know I'm so glad uh, John Carpenter has uh, <laughs> you know the way he's gone it just yeah. kind of uh, I was just a bit wary it's and, better than it should be yeah oh it is yeah. really it's, good it sounds like yeah. it's fun and look to be fair like the reviews at the time were all similar to what, what's been said yeah by the, the only problem with Scream 4 is that I then I bought that in Blu-ray and then felt that I had to buy Scream 3 to sit there on the <laughs> shelf in between yeah. two and four, so that's the only downside is that I had to buy Scream Three. But no, it's re- it's a really good sequel. I would have said it was pretty much equal of two. Yeah, cool. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, I'll check it. I'm excited. And his last credit was as executive producer on Scream, the TV series of this year. Yeah. Now I don't know anything about this, so I don't know if you guys I, have seen I it. I haven't seen it. I know that it doesn't feature Ghost Ghost Faced. It isn't set in Woodsboro. I don't even know if Stab exists in this universe. The, the, Stab. The films, yeah. the film within a film. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've heard... Name. Yeah. It's an interesting idea. So obviously they've got a, a season-long yeah. arc of wondering who the killer is. But then you've got that problem of surely you need a murder every episode. So how many characters can you have in like 13 weeks? Get bumped off. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm interested to see it. I mean, there's just so much good TV out these days. It's yeah. hard to, to get around to it, you know. But... um. I mean, it's not the first franchise of his that had a TV series. There was Nightmare on Elm Street had one as well. Yeah, um, not a great. Album. It wasn't great. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah, I probably... That was an anthology show, wasn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. This is our first episode where we look at a director exclusively, bro. True. So a couple of director trademarks here throughout a lot of Wes Craven's movies. His characters often use elaborate booby traps to capture the villain. I was just going to say, one of the things I like about Scream and a lot of his films uh, is that they actually start to fight back. It actually really grates me in horror films when everyone's just running. Mm. And at some point, you've got to go, no, hang on. <laughs> you've got to turn around and you've got to fight back and there's heaps of that in Scream. And yeah, it's that, good. It's, it's, yeah, it's a good release of all the tension that's come before. I think people also like you know can put themselves in that situation a bit more, that they would do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. A bit yeah. fighting back, yeah. Often features strong female characters. Another thing... Once, uh, he, once he got over the rape revenge stuff, yeah. Yep. Yeah. His unglamorous depictions of sadistic and realistically brutal killers. His protagonists are often ordinary characters caught in extraordinary and horrific circumstances, yep. which seems pretty standard in a lot of horror films. Yeah, a lot, this, horror a films, lot yeah. of this seems like yeah. horror stuff, but yeah. yeah. Well, here we go. We looked at a Paul Verhoeven film a couple of weeks ago. Brutal and graphic depiction of violence. I guess maybe it's More obvious early, early of yeah. stuff. I was just about to say that. Villains are often deformed and monstrous looking. Well, poor Mike, Michael Berryman didn't have any makeup on for Hill of Eyes. But <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I guess. His horror films often contain important social issues. Yep. And children in his films are often deformed or brutally murdered, often by the main villain. Uh, children is yeah, what? People um, Under the Stairs has, has that going has on. kids, uh, yeah. Yeah. A little bit of trivia here from uh, Wes Craven's uh, career here, bro. So, uh, the Elm Street is located in Potsdam, New York, a small town just south of the Canadian border. Craven was a humanities professor at Clarkson College, also in Potsdam. His vision of Freddy Krueger came from a childhood memory. When he was 10 years old, he looked out the window of the apartment he lived in, and a drunk man dressed similar to Freddy was looking directly at him and continued to stay there looking at the window for several minutes. This scared him, so later on he decided this will be the look for Freddy. Mm. Yeah, I More like on that. the look on Freddy, I was just going to say the jarring red and green stripes. Yep. Like a, yep. Was it he looked up something, what the, the worst colours that can go together for the human eye? Oh. And it was. Oh, that's yeah. cool. So it was all. Yeah, red and know, green, the, 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 the brain can't quite process it. Yeah. It's jarring instantly for you and then it takes all a while through. To that's awesome. The other thing, too, is that, that that old man or whatever, the drunk man that looked up at him in his window, he talked about that, that it wasn't just that he was kind of menacing and staring at him, it was that he looked away and then when he looked back out again, the guy was still looking up and he saw the joy the man had trying to freak out just a young kid just the joy of scaring someone and he injected that kind of element into Freddy wow, as well definitely there, yeah. really enjoys scaring the shit out of someone yeah really sums up just for their right own there. entertainment yeah based the story of A Nightmare on Elm Street on a news report about a group of young men who died in their sleep during horrific nightmares yeah. despite having no history of health problems and showing no specific cause of death He's the only person to direct more than one film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and New Nightmare. 
he nearly turned down the option to direct the hit Scream because the first scene with Drew Barrymore reminded him too vividly of the climax sequence of The Last House on the Left, his first film. Wow. Can you, make, mm. can you draw anything between those yeah, two? Yeah, no, I, I, I see that point. Does I mean, it feature yeah. popcorn? Um, <laughs> it, it features a microwave. Uh, yeah. no, there was, no, did she do it on the... She did it on the stove, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, the microwave. Yeah. yeah, so, well, the remake featured the microwave. Um, <laughs> no, there you go. Yeah, Ooh. <laughs> yeah no, I guess. I, uh, yeah, you can see that. I mean, I, I, would, I didn't think... Woman he, in Distress. Was Wes Craven the first choice for Scream? I thought he was the second choice, but I might be wrong. Not sure, actually. It's something have, I remember from the time when the first film came. We might out. have to revisit that approach when we look at the Scream series. Well, <laughs> Someone well, else taking the reins. We'll all be unavailable for that, even McCaskill for number three. <laughs> <laughs> when actor producer Robert Evans suffered a stroke on May 6, 1998, Craven was having a drink with him in Evans' screening room when he collapsed in front of him. Evans later quipped. I really scared the shit out of the King of Horror. (laughs) (laughs) He developed the evil house premise for the computer game Wes Craven's Principles of Fear. Although the game won About Games Bronze Medal Award for Interactive Fiction when the prototype was demonstrated at the 1997 Electronic Entertainment Expo in Atlanta, the game was never completed due to the financial failure of the game's publisher. Aww. What's that? Where's Craven's Principles of Fear? Yeah, never. 90s video game. Yeah, it would have been pretty cool, I guess. How's this? I, know, I did not know this. Was set to direct Superman 4... The Quest for Peace oh. in 1987, but was replaced after creative differences with star Christopher Reeve. Oh. I, I had heard that, yeah. I remember something about it. It's that. crazy. Yeah. Superman that 4, is, directed by Wes Christopher Craig. Reeve. <laughs> Couldn't have been any worse, though, could it? Yeah. So, no. It's not so but bad. I Christopher mean, Reeve took it over completely, didn't he, in the end? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, look at what, what happened there. Because that was, that was Christopher the Christopher Reeve rewrote chunks of it, too. Break away from I'm sure, horror. yeah. I, w- I feel so sorry for him. I'm yeah. sure he was desperate to do something else. He had a highly dysfunctional relationship with his parents, mainly having been raised by a severe hyper-religious mother, whom he never allowed to watch his films, <laughs> and never having a close relationship with his distant, violet-tempered father. His mother's judgmental influence caused him to be too terrified to talk to a girl until he was at college and that led him to marry, in his opinion, too young, and <laughs> arguably contributed to the angry, bleak themes of his early films. Wow. I guess that makes sense. That makes sense. Daddy issues. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Life lessons there for you? Absolutely. Mm. So just quickly in regard to some of the awards or nominations that he received, uh, during his career, Wes Craven was nominated for and won several awards, including the Saturn Award. Of course. In 1977, he won the Critics Award at the the Sidges Film Festival for his film The Hills Have Eyes. And um, it was also the uh, Gerard Ma Film Festival granted him the grand prize in 1997 for Scream. And in 2012, the New York City Horror Film Festival awarded Craven the Lifetime Achievement Award. Very much deserved, I would think. And unfortunately, he passed away on August 30th this year of brain cancer at the age of 76 at his home in Los Angeles. And apparently the 10th episode of the Scream series was dedicated to his memory like you'd expect it to be. We're just going to wrap this up, guys, with some final thoughts on on Craven and also your personal favorite pieces of his uh, of his work, whether that be his writing, directing, or you know anything else. So I'll start over here with you, Stu. I'm quite excited that you're all going to go out and watch Scream Four now, and uh, you suggested that we might look at that series at some stage. I, I think we would have to. I'm quite I'm quite keen to do that. Um, <laughs> But yes, uh, it was a, it was a bit of a surprise loss, I guess. I, I don't, I don't. He wasn't, as far as we know, he wasn't sick at the, at the time. So yeah, I was quite upset to hear that. It is a pity, but so many awesome films to look back on. Definitely favorite pieces oh, yeah. of work. Well, yeah, Scream is my favorite for me. Cool, Bruce. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a great career and, and some really significant films in amongst everything that he made. I guess in a way, he's a victim of his own genre in that I don't know, it, seemed, it seemed hard for him to make the films he wanted to make because even right up until he, the end of his career if he had the right budget and the right script um, he could pull together an amazing film and, and Scream 4 is, is hopefully going to prove that um, as his last feature film so if you look through his career there's I don't know eight, nine films in there very significant horror films but it's only that's a third of his, his output which is really impressive for me you know re- reading of his passing it, it just seemed 
even for a guy that's had a career of 30, 40 years, it just seems too soon mm. <laughs> um, because it just would have been nice for him to be a little bit more prolific, I suppose. But you can't question the impact he's had on, on horror cinema. He's just phenomenal. So it's, it's, it's really sad. Favourite pieces of his um, work? Without sounding too much like Adam, <laughs> his, his ability to create iconic characters is just insane. And he's done two significant horror characters in Freddy Krueger and, and Ghostface and created their own menace their own personality injecting the humor into Freddy Krueger films kind of helped make the cheap cheap low budget look work in its favor the, the elongated arms down the alleyway in particular which look ridiculous but managed to work because of of, of his direction and uh, and then yeah creating the Ghostface character which has elements of in my mind anyway slapstick and, and is almost a fallible horror villain but still very intense and very scary. So just creating characters, he's just he spends obviously a lot of time on that and or spent a lot of time on that and, and was phenomenal at it. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Matt? Yeah, um, I guess he was given as a shock all the way to the end, really, because uh, none of us really saw his passing coming. Like, you know, we didn't... I, w- I wasn't aware that he was sick. But um, it's uh, he's a strange director. Like, when you think of great directors like Spielberg or... Or even horror directors like Carpenter, they they seem to have like a, a you know, a, a directors generally seem to have like a run of films like Coppola, where they're just making amazing kick-ass films one after the other, mm-hmm. and then it kind of tails off. This guy seemed to make amazing kick-ass films every now and then over the mm-hmm. space of three decades, which is which is bizarre in itself. So uh, you know, when you think you know he releases something like a. Uh, Scream 3 and he's down and out all of a sudden he comes up with Nightmare on Elm Street or you know like it, it just he, he just seemed to a few years later come back punching with uh, an amazing film so uh, yeah it's it's a it's a strange uh, pattern of, of movies that he had really but um, yeah definitely a, a master of horror which I think I'm not sure if he did an episode of but uh, probably should have anyway but uh, yeah he's uh, he's definitely a, a master of that craft and, and, and will be remembered as such I think uh as a, a big horror director. Is that your favourite piece of his work? Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, yeah that's, the, uh, that's the one for me. Uh, yeah. I do enjoy a few of his films, but that one's the just kind of stand out yeah. just from, from, you know, nostalgia re- reasons and, yeah. you know. I, I think I'm going to echo you there just quickly as well, Matt. I think uh, the first Nightmare on Elm Street would be my favourite piece of his work, also just because of the iconic nature of the... Uh, character, the yeah. character, yeah, definitely. And uh, but I'm also Stu, a big, big fan of the uh, the first Scream film, so that would definitely be up there as well. I want to check out some more of his stuff, um, particularly some of the ones that you guys uh, have seen that I haven't that you uh, recommended I check out, like um, Red Eye and uh, Serpent and the Rainbow. Serpent yeah. and the Rainbow, yeah. You've got to watch Shocker as well. You Shocker, watch Shocker. <laughs> People <laughs> under the stairs, I can lend all these to you. <laughs> I'm sure you Step can. Into the Matt O'Neill Library yeah. of Horror. So that's um, that's going to wrap up this episode, guys. So thanks very much for coming out discussing the career of uh, the legendary Wes Craven and um, Bros up next I can't believe we're up to it Back to the Future bing. indeed wow Stuart's <laughs> dropped a bing I, it's, it's, it's going to be a phenomenal episode and I predict maybe the longest record in the history of real chat I think we're going to do a podcast twice the length of the original film I think <laughs> I think that's the plan can I, can I be on this one <laughs> that's the plan Matt that is the plan are you, are you excited Stu <laughs> can I be on this one no you can't <laughs> <laughs> but you know what you can do for the last hour of the record is just hang around outside <laughs> waiting for us to finish if you like okay. oh cool yeah. that sounds yeah. good I'll if you're that. lucky it'll be a sunny day oh, so, nice. Yeah. nice thanks very much guys no Thank you. thanks Cheers. guys You can keep in touch with us here at Real Chat by visiting realchat.com.au. Check us out on Twitter at Real Chat Podcast, Instagram, real underscore chat underscore podcast, and we're on YouTube, Real Chat Podcast. Surprise, surprise. And track us down on Facebook. You can hit iTunes for new episodes and check out some of our old episodes. Thanks for listening. 